Hello everyone, I'm Rania Kalik, and this is Dispatches. As Iran prepares for presidential elections, I'm joined by Navid Zarinal, who's visiting Lebanon from Iran to discuss developments in Iran from the coming elections to the tumultuous Trump years, relations with the Biden administration, as well as Iran's role in the region. Navid, welcome to Breakthrough News. Thank you, Rania, for having me. I'm so excited to just get into it. Um, so like I said, you are visiting us in Lebanon from Iran. From what I understand, you'll be voting from here in the Iranian elections. Before we get into all of that, can you just start by introducing yourself? What have you studied, your academic background? What do you teach? Uh, and where have you been for the last year? Sure. Uh, yes, so my name is Navid Zarinal, and that's the uh, anglicized version. So if you want to really Persianize it, you would say Zarinal. Um, and I I'm totally a, failed. I completely failed to do that, by the way, as everybody saw. <laughs> no, no, no. That was actually, it was very good. For somebody who hasn't spoken Persian uh, growing up, it was, it was very good. Well, thank you. <laughs> so back to you. <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, and so I'm a PhD candidate at Columbia University, and I specialize in Iranian history. Um, and also I'm interested in uh, theories of imperialism and post-colonial theory. Um, and I've been living in Iran for the past year and a half, uh, doing archival research, uh, but also just uh, living there. And I'm based between uh, US and Iran, so I, I move back and forth a lot. Uh, for research and and uh, other things. Yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting. You were in Iran for basically for all of COVID, uh, which we can get into as well. But I guess let's first start with the fact that, you know, right now Iran is, of course, in the news uh, for two reasons. So let's start there, right? The elections and, of course, the nuclear talks between Washington and Tehran. Um, so let's start with the elections. Uh, outside observers usually divide the Iranian political scene between the reformers and the conservatives or the hardliners, as they're often referred to. And so I guess let's start with, is that an accurate representation or is that simplistic? And what policies actually differentiate these two camps? Um, that's right. So uh, I think in order to talk about the uh, reformers and the so-called hardliners, it's important to have some context because I think a lot of uh, a lot of Westerners and Americans uh, kind of come to uh, the binary of reformers and hardliners without, without really knowing the context. Uh, so, if you want to approach it with the con the historical context, uh, what you have before the before the Iranian Revolution that happens in 1979 uh, is you have a number of uh, parties. Uh, and political groupings, not all of them are officially parties, but they are political collectives that are organizing ag against the Shah. And so one group are the Mossadegh allied nationalists. So the nationalists that were active during the Mossadegh years. And as your viewers might know, Mohammad Mossadegh was the democratically elected uh, prime minister of Iran who tried to nationalize Iranian oil in 1951. And then he was overthrown by a CIA-backed uh, coup d'etat in 1953. So you have his partisans uh, that are organizing uh, from 53 uh, to uh, 1980. Uh, and, and, and a big example of them is Nehzat uh, Azadi Iran, or the Liberation Movement of Iran. So that's one camp. Um, and the, uh, for the second camp, uh, you have uh, the communists, so to the party, for example, uh, was was a communist uh, political party, and then you also have the Islamic socialist hybrids that were influenced by the ideology of intellectuals such as Ali Shariati, who were trying to synthesize uh, Shiism with Marxism. Uh, and an example of of this grouping is the uh, MEK. Uh, and then, in addition to so the Mossadegh ally nationalists, uh, then you have the uh, communists, then you have the Islamic and socialist hybrids, but then you also had Islamic parties that were not interested in, in socialism or communism. Uh, and of the most successful of them that actually consolidated power after the revolution was the Islamic Republican Party. Uh, so the Islamic Republican Party consolidates power in competition and exclusion 
uh, of other uh, political parties and groupings that were active after the revolution. And then the so-called reformists and the hardliners, they were all part of the Islamic, or, or most of them at least, were par uh, part of the Islamic Republican Party in the 1980s when Iran was fighting the Iran-Iraq war and the revolution was in its uh, younger days. But what happens is starting in the 1990s and after is that there's a split in the Islamic Republican Party. So you have the reformist uh, people like Khatami, who was president, uh, the president of Iran. Um, and the, the reformists, uh, their demands were things like the liberalization of the public sphere and also the liberalization of the economy and also more contact with the West. And even some of them wanted uh, full normalization with the U.S. and to this day still want normalization with the U.S. Um, uh, and uh, uh, so that's what the reformists kind of believe in. And the, the, the indigenous Persian term for it is Islah Talab. And then the, the, the so-called hardliners, and this is the term that is not indigenous. So if you actually follow Iranian and Persian media, they will not have an equivalent of the hardliner, uh, even though sometimes, I mean, they try to uh, translate these terms back into back into Persian, but they don't really, we don't really have an indigenous term for hardliner, uh, but the so-called hardliners, um, uh, who most of them are, belong to the principalist uh, political party, uh, and you can also call them engalabi or revolutionary. Uh, so uh, this group uh, believes in the resistant economy and very strong national uh, production to limit uh, import dependency as much as possible, and they also believe in cultural authenticity, um, and I think a third point on foreign policy is that a limited engagement with the West and also having, uh, uh, having a, a resistance a foreign policy with countries like Yemen uh, and Iraq uh, and so on. So that is, the, that is the split that happens in the 1990s. So the reformists on the one hand and, and the people who were more revolutionary, more ideologically revolutionary on the other or the so-called hardliner. And, and one, one last point that I have to mention is that the, the reason I think the hardliner uh, terminology is simplistic is because it's from the perspective of the West. So it's from the perspective of what West priorities or, uh, has as its priorities in the, in, in the international order. And uh, there's a really interesting colonial background to this. So if you actually look at the British sources from the 19th century, uh, whoever in the global South was advocating rebellion against colonial rule, uh, they were called the extremists or the hardliners versus the moderates, right? So another term the, mo the reformers are identified with that is not indigenous to Persian is moderates, right? Even though, again, they translated back into Persian. Uh, but so the moderate extremists or the moderate hardliner, that has a colonial legacy behind it. And in this case, too, I think because the revolutionaries or the principalists uh, one limited engagement with the West, and they're very cautious because of colonial history, and they don't want to liberalize the economy. Uh, they are uh, labeled as hardliner, um, and I guess not extremists yet, but they call them the hardliners. And what's interesting to me is that when we uh, think about these terms like conservative and hardliner, if you actually look at what you, what you just described, I mean, just subjectively speaking, especially in economic terms, it actually sounds like the so-called reformists are more conservative when it comes to the economy versus the so-called hardliners or conservatives are actually more to the left on the economy. Like you were talking about um, the, the conservative hardliners. I don't know what word to use in English, but you were talking about what we in the West would call hardliners as being more interested in not being so import dependent, right? So having some economic sovereignty and the ability to produce your own material. Whereas when we think about the word reformist, it's actually referring to people like you mentioned who want to liberalize the, con the economy. So that's actually a more conservative economics. So that's what's so ironic to me. But then again, it shouldn't be so ironic because you mentioned the word moderate. And then when we think about the way the word moderate is used by the West, it's also used to refer to the people in Syria that we called moderate rebels who actually were like mm. Al Qaeda linked jihadists. That's so right. I'm glad that you I'm glad that you broke that down because it's absolutely connected to colonial terminology. When we think when when the West comes up with words like hardliner versus reformist, they're really just referring to what it means for Western interests. Hundred percent, and I mean that's an excellent point because uh, uh, the 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 term conservative. Uh, is actually a misnomer here. And if you're actually reading the English press right now, they refer to uh, Sayyid Ibrahim al-Raisi 
uh, who is one of the more revolutionary. So the, the characteristics I describe, resistant economy, cultural authenticity, limited engagement with the West, um, uh, Sayyid Raisa Ibrahimi has those policies and he's identified in the Western press as an ultra conservative. But there's nothing conservative about that, right? So if you actually want to liberalize the economy and the culture and the, and the political culture and so on, um, you could say that's actually more con conservative or put differently, if you, if you want to go along with a liberal world order, that's a more conservative position in my estimation. So I think, yeah, this term of hardliner, conservative, ultra conservative, uh, they don't really apply. So back to the election issue, I mean, do you expect any major changes? How would you, and maybe let's take a step back and, and, and explain to our listeners and viewers, because of course the only representation or interpretation of the Iranian political system we ever get in the US media is that it's some sort of theocratic dictatorship, but it's actually way more complex than that. And there are elections that people vote in on both the local and national level. So. That said, how would you define Iran's political system? We know there's elections, there's different candidates with diverging opinions, but then we're also hearing that some of them have been disqualified by the Guardian Council. So why is that and what does that mean in the broader context of Iran's political system? Yes, and uh, that's a great question. So uh, in terms of describing the Iranian political system, uh, I think the best uh, description is, or the best uh, phrase uh, is a theocratic democracy or theocratic uh, republic. So that is, you have constitutionally in Iran, uh, you have certain um, uh, powers reserved for the clergy, for the Shia clergy, and then you also have popular and democratic representation. So it's a hybrid of those. Uh, and uh, to the Western experience and the European experience, this sounds very contradictory and oxymoronic, right? Because the Western experience is that uh, liberal democracy emerges in distinction to the Catholic Church, right? So the idea is that you actually want to uh, eliminate a theocracy in order to have democracy. But the Iranian experience is actually very different. And I think when people say that, oh, theocratic uh, republic or democracy is a contradiction, they don't really understand that the Iranian experience is not the same as the Western experience, right? And if you actually look at the history of the Shia clergy in Iran, historically, they were popular with the masses and they were also a safeguard against the power of the ruler or the sultan or the Shah, right? So they would try to safeguard the, not all of them, but but many of them uh, would try to safeguard the interest of the community against the ruling dynasty, uh, right? So it's the, 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 the Christian and the Western history is very different than the Iranian one. So in that sense, I think theocratic democracy is not an oxymoron. And also, I mean, if you compare it with liberalism, I mean, in liberalism too, uh, if you read, for example, the writings of John Rawls, what what the what the liberal theorists try to do is that they try to reconcile liberty with equality, right? So, I mean, at, at its face, it might sound oxymoronic that that the liberty of the capital owning class can be reconciled with the equality of the working classes, but that's what uh, welfare uh, democracies have been trying to do for the past several decades. Uh, and so, what what they try to do is that they try to reconcile the liberty of the capital owning class with the equality of the working classes. So they put the welfare state in. So just as you can reconcile uh, liberty and equality under liberalism, I don't see why you cannot reconcile mm -hmm. theocracy with democracy. You have some powers for the clergy and some power for the voting masses. That's actually a really good point. Um, and then, as for you know the issue of you know what we've been hearing in the U.S. about the elections as candidates certain candidates being disqualified. What is happening with that? Why have certain candidates been disqualified? Yes, um, so uh, the, there is a council. And actually, I do want to preface that to say, before you actually get into the details of that, that I do think that there's this kind of like moral superiority that we have, um, or that the Western media absolutely has, especially coming from the US, where you literally have to raise millions of dollars, maybe even a billion dollars to, 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 run, to successfully run for president. And we actually do have pre-qualified candidates. I just want to say that because it's always interesting to me that these U.S. pundits feel like they're in a position to talk down to any other country about democracy when the U.S. doesn't really have one. But anyways, please continue with your, no, with no, your that's, response. That's, that's, an excellent, that's an excellent point. Uh, and in fact, if you want to compare the Guardian Council with corporate financing in the U.S., uh, the Guardian Council actually has indirect representation from the people, but I don't think you can make the same case uh, for big capital and big corporations in the U.S. that 
that uh, tried to control the elections. Uh, and so if you actually want to look at the constitutional process of the Guardian Council or the Shorai Negahban uh, in the Iranian context, uh, so the public votes for the Assembly of Islamic Experts, and then the Assembly of Ex Islamic Experts chooses the leader, and then the leader chooses the Guardian Council. So in that chain of succession, you see that the Guardian Council is indirectly linked to popular representation. So there is a limited amount of popular representation uh, behind the Guardian Council, at least in the constitutional process, um, right? And then what happens is that it's a, it's a much shorter cycle compared to the American election. So if you're used to the U.S. elections, you know, you have these candidates that run about a year and a half before uh, the actual election day, and then you have nonstop, uh, basically, uh, trash on TV that's difficult to watch, uh, including the, some of the debates. Uh, so it's a year and a half process. It's just very long, and at some point, um, at some point, I mean, like, I want to lose interest, but then it's also entertaining, so. <laughs> well, it's like reality TV, but like political reality TV in America. That's right. Elections. That's right, yeah. So, I mean, it is reality TV. Um, and, yeah, so it's long and uh, tiring. But with the, with the Iranian one, it's uh, what happens is, and I'm not making a value judgment on the Iranian one, whether the, 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 the shorter duration is good, but as a descriptive matter, uh, about a about six weeks to eight weeks before the election, the candidates register, and many candidates from different uh, political ideologies register. Um, and then what happens is that the Guardian Council uh, approves or disapproves of the candidates, and usually you have about a 10 or less, uh, something between 5 to 10, uh, that remain for the election, and then a month before you have a number of debates, uh, and then people go and vote, and this year it will be this Friday, uh, that's when the voting day is. Uh, but another, I think, an important point here is uh, even though uh, the, the Guardian Council's mandate does have anti-democratic uh, qualities to it, uh, if, you, if you're reading the English pre press right now in the Iranian elections, they are making it like, you know, the, there's no ideological diversity between the candidates that the Guardian Council approve. Um, but you actually do have ideological diversity. Uh, so there's a candidate, uh, Mohsen Meh Alizadeh, uh, who is a Khatami appointee, and he was also the governor during Rouhani's rule, and he's more from the reformist camp. And you also have Hemmati, who uh, is the director of the central bank, um, and uh, he has reformist inclinations. He, ha he has even expressed interest in meeting Biden one-on-one, -on -one, uh, which would be the first uh, you know, high official meeting of this kind. Uh, since the revolution, if you don't count uh, Jabhat Zarif meeting with Kerry during the nuclear negotiations. Uh, but yeah, so you have these candidates, and then you also have the principalist candidate or the candidate I mentioned before, uh, Sayyid Ibrahim al raisi um, who, who, whose ideology matches the leaders more. Uh, so you have this diversity, but the, the, the English press has made it out like, you know, there's no diversity whatsoever. And I think the reason is this, this time the reformist candidates uh, haven't really galvanized uh, reformist passion, especially in the diaspora as much. So if you talk mm -hmm. to diaspora Iranians, they're like, uh, we don't have any candidates that are interesting, right? So I think that's one reason there's... Uh, mm, yeah. I see. You know, it's also interesting to me, um, watching mainstream media in the U.S., this... I, I heard this like segment, I can't remember what channel it was, it was on, but it was a report about the Iranian presidential elections and all these candidates have been disqualified. And the reporter was lamenting the fact that uh, Ahmadinejad had been disqualified. And I'm just thinking to myself, but you guys hated this guy when he was president. Like the US media couldn't stop vilifying him when he was president. And now you're gonna cry because he's disqualified. Like what are you gonna intervene in Iran? Because Ahmadinejad, the guy you wanted to overthrow 10 years ago, is disqualified. Like, that just made me laugh from, from just a, a pure hypocritical standpoint. But no. go ahead. Sorry if you want to respond to I that. Mean, uh, with, with Ahmadinejad, too, I mean, I think uh, uh, he's, uh, he's been tweeting out of his English account about basketball and American football <laughs> and Tupac. I mean, I love Tupac. Uh, but I just don't understand, like, he's really trying to connect with Americans or whoever is running his Twitter, uh, probably with, with his approval. So maybe that's one reason. I mean, there's definitely that hypocrisy, but I think there's also this kind of, oh, well, this guy might not be as bad as we thought he was. So because yeah, he likes about, America now. <laughs> yeah, because he likes American football. So. Uh, <laughs> 
Okay, so so I guess moving on from the issue of the elections, um, in your view, uh, do most Iranians want the restoration of the nuclear deal uh, first signed between the Obama administration and Iran? Um, yeah. And did did that deal bring relief to people back when it was signed? Because uh, after Trump, there's this new trend of you know mistrust. You know that the U.S. doesn't want to offer concessions at all. And even if they say they will, they'll renege on those concessions. So I guess, what's the view from your time spent in Iran over the last year or so that you've been there? What's your um, what's your impression of, of people's desire to either go back to the deal or not? That's right. I mean, I would say in terms of going back to the deal, uh, there's a, a good degree of uh, popular support for it. And I think even Raisi, who is one of the more revolutionary candidates or in the English nomenclature, hardliner candidates, uh, I think he's even expressed interest in, in going back to the deal. Um, so there's that, but then it's not really about the deal. Rather, uh, most Iranians want sanctions relief, right? Yeah. So from uh, the shopkeeper to the politician to the, to the teacher uh, to the uh, global savvy traveler, uh, they want sanctions relief, uh, right? So, and if the nuclear deal is a means uh, to sanctions relief, uh, then, then uh, they, they embrace it. Uh, although, I mean, even even with the sanctions, uh, the the Iranian economy hasn't hasn't suffered uh, as much as uh, the West and its allies wanted to. But at the same time, um, they do want Iranians do want sanctions relief. Um, and regarding changes after the nuclear deal, the second part of your question. Uh, so I remember when uh, the nuclear uh, deal was signed. Um, in two, I think it was the summer of 2015, I was actually in the Arab world and then I traveled back to Iran and I went, you know, the subsequent years too, uh, before, before Trump pulled out of the deal in May of 2018. And not much had changed uh, regarding what U.S. was supposed to deliver. So, I mean, um, I don't think Iran could transact, uh, transact on the international uh, banking system. So they couldn't, mm -hmm. so if you, if you wanted to pay someone from an Iranian bank, um, or, you know, some big company in Iran wanted to pay a company in Europe. I don't think they were able to do that. Um, so that wasn't accomplished. And even uh, there were, you know, uh, deals at the elite level after a nuclear deal. So Iran Air, the uh, Iranian airline company, had a very big contract with Boeing, the Chicago-based uh, plane company. And Boeing never delivered the planes, as far as I know. Uh, yeah, Boeing oh. never delivered the planes. And I mean, I guess their excuse was that, well, Trump is president and he might want to uh, uh, withdraw from the deal. Um, so we're not going to deliver uh, mm -hmm. on the planes until we know what's going to happen, right? Uh, so not much changed. I mean, so Iran wasn't really doing business with the, with the uh, outside world in, in an in a, uh, open manner. Um, and uh, another important thing is uh, the currency value. So the currency value didn't improve um, mm. from the time the deal was signed to the time that, that Trump withdrew. And after he withdrew, the, 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 the value of the currency actually uh, collapsed. I mean, it, it collapsed, so it, it lost value by seven times. Um, wow. Yeah. So that's devastating. I don't think people understand what that means. I mean, when a currency devalues, it means, I mean, just because our, our most of our viewers and listeners are are Western and they don't have to deal with this kind of stuff. But if your currency loses value, like to that degree, let's say 10, seven times, like you just said, that means your salary, if you make seven thousand dollars a year, goes from seven thousand in dollar, like in the equivalent in dollars, goes from being worth seven thousand dollars to being worth a thousand dollars a year. Yes. Um, it's de it's completely devastating on people's livelihoods when that it is happens. Indeed. It is indeed, and I mean the thing is, when it comes to the consumption of domestic goods, some of them some of them get inflated because uh, of the currency devaluation. Uh, but b because Iran has a very strong national industry uh, and also national food production, uh, food prices don't go up as much. But then, mm -hmm. if you're buying uh, imported goods, so if you want to buy an imported car or an imported laptop, because Iran doesn't make laptops, then the price of laptops is astronomical. I mean, what you have to pay for a laptop, I mean, in the US uh, or in, in the EU, I mean, you pay what, uh, maybe 1,500 euros or uh, $1,300 for a good laptop. Uh, but then that, that price, you have to pay in dollars if you're buying 
uh, a laptop, say an HP or a Microsoft Surface or an Apple, right. especially because it's an American company in Iran. Um, so yeah, it's it can be very difficult, and also it makes travel difficult. So if you want to travel, uh, so I mean, because the 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 value of the Lebanese. Uh, uh, lira was also devalued might be easier to travel between Iran and Lebanon But if you wanted to go to a country that has a stronger currency Then you basically cannot go or if you want to buy a plane ticket it becomes very difficult So what, what what's what the sanctions are doing? Uh, is the the currency devaluation? I think that's an that's a, a consequence of the sanctions and then it also makes it difficult for all these Iranians to be connected to the outside world to actually travel and see their neighbors and and so on you know, and that kind of leads into the next question I wanted to ask you, which you kind of answered a little bit, but I'd love to del delve deeper into it a bit because you have spent the last year or so in Iran, like we mentioned. Um, and so, you know, as, from what you just described, I mean, just being on the ground and seeing the way people of different classes are having to deal with the consequences of things like currency devaluation and other ways that sanctions impact, you know, how have sanctions affected people in a real material sense? And how have they coped? Um, and are there signs, I mean, you've kind of mentioned some of them, but are there signs that Iran has increased its own self-sufficiency and managed to create an alternative economy that's less vulnerable to the consequences of sanctions from the US? That's right. Um, so, I mean, the, the policy, I mean, the policy of the leader especially is one of uh, resistance economy. So the leader gives a new uh, name to every new year. Um, so the, the Iranian New Year was on March, March 20th, um, and for the past, uh, past several years, the leader has focused on giving the name of a national production or production leap. Uh, some of the names are very long, and it's, it's not very good for, uh, for, for the uh, year to have such a long name, but the, the basic idea is national production. So the official polish, uh, policy is one of resistance economy and national production, but then the problem is that the consumer habits uh, and, uh, and other limitations don't always make it easy. Um, so the thing is, uh, Iran actually produces uh, really amazing hygienic products, for example. So if you want to buy you know, shampoo, cream, whatever, going to the pharmacy or, or the store, uh, if you want to get these things, the Iranian-made ones are just as good, if not better, as the competitors from the outside. But the problem is that the consumers like to buy foreign products because it kind of has a prestige and they're like, oh, you know, I'm cooler if I, if I bought a European made product. So a lot of times I'm buying a cream and I'm, I'm looking very hard at where it's made. So I actually look at all the fine print and then I'd actually see that it's produced in Iran and I buy it. But then I get tricked because on the, for example, on the lotion, there's a big uh, Canadian flag or there's a big Swiss <laughs> flag, even though there's no connection whatsoever to Canada or, or Switzerland in a lot of cases. <laughs> That's actually clever. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, is there is there an argument to be made, um, or is there anybody making the argument that Iran shouldn't concede at all and go back to a nuclear deal? Is that even a part of the conversation? Or is it kind of an across the board, we need to get back into this deal? Yeah. Uh, I mean, there, 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 is, there are certain parliamentary sessions uh, where members of parliament kind of make a big fuzz and they're like, uh, no, the nuclear deal is bogus, and you cannot. And yeah, also ask about trust. Like you cannot trust the U.S. after Trump withdrew. I mean, you cannot trust them because of the 1953 coup d'état against Mohammad Mossadegh. But you can also not trust them because Trump uh, unilaterally withdrew from the deal. So th there are those conversations in the parliament. Uh, but I would say that generally, uh, most politicians and especially the people are open to uh, to going back to the deal. Uh, but I mean, uh, one I think one uh, one strong argument that can be made against the return to the nuclear deal at a, at a more kind of idealistic and theoretical level uh, is that the the nuclear deal was never about nuclear weapons and it was never about world peace and security, even though that's the PR that it gets. Uh, the real reason is imperialist domination, and there's actually a the, 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 a very uh, similar history of. The, the nuclear deal in Iranian history, and if you would let me indulge you uh, for a second in a okay historical illustration, hopefully your your re, uh, your viewers will also like it. Um, but basically, so there's a really interesting uh, precedent to the nuclear deal. Um, so what happened in the uh, in the late 19th century, around the turn of the 20th century, so about 120 years ago. 
um, I was reading the, the memoirs, the diaries of uh, Ehtisham al-Saltane, who was an aristocrat in the Qajar court at the turn of the 20th century. And the Qajar court was a dynasty that ruled before the Pahlavis and Muhammad Reza Shah, who the US backed, he was part of the Pahlavi dynasty. But the Qajar dynasty was, was before them from about 1798 to 1921. And so at the turn of the 20th century, Ehtisham um, al-Saltaneh speaks about this deal that uh, the Iranian government had with Britain. And the deal was basically that uh, no military grade weapons can enter Iran. So all military weapons are banned from entering Iranian territory. Uh, and the reason the British had given was that they did not want the Afghan tribes that were not under British control to be empowered. And also they did not want the nomads who were by the Persian Gulf region to be armed to you know, fight the British uh, because British had interest in the Persian Gulf that would connect them to India. Um, and what's interesting is that the Iranian government actually did not put up a fight because in the case of uh, currently, they, they had definitely put up a fight against the uh, nuclear uh, the uh, the nuclear deal and positions that the, that the U.S. wants to put on them, but at that time, because the Iranian government itself was scared of the nomads in the Persian Gulf region, such, such as the Bakhtiaris, thinking that if they're armed, uh, then they will pose a threat to the central government in Tehran, they did not put up a fight, and they said, okay, we will not import any military weapons to the point that if somebody wanted to bring an official gift like a weapon to the to a minister at the at the courts in Tehran uh, there were a lot there would be a lot of obstructions against us so they would try mm -hmm. to prevent the minister from receiving just one weapon right so history repeats itself just as the british were imposing imperialist domination of the region and forcing iran not to import military weapons in a similar way the us right now is uh, does not want iran to have nuclear weapons not because it cares about world security and peace but because of imperialist domination. So there is a strong argument against concession because the question is why should these double standards exist if the US is a country that actually threatens world peace through invading uh, countries like Iraq, uh, why, why, should, why, why is it Iran that should not have a nuclear weapon? Or the US has used nuclear weapons against Japan, but they get to have it, and Iran does. So there's this double standard, and there's no equality of sovereignties here. So I think if you're against imperialist domination, and if, if we are for equality of sovereignties, uh, then Iran should not concede. But then whether this idealistic argument fit the political reality, that's a different question. And as right. history tells us, global South nations do have to concede and compromise on some of these issues. Of course. Um... And yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, there's also the issue of Israel. Israel gets to have a nuclear nuclear weapons in the region. Um, and that's not to be ever questioned, right? It's just a given. We're just all supposed to accept that as the default. Uh, when Israel is the most aggressive power in the region, uh, meanwhile, Iran hasn't you know, invaded any countries. Um, uh, and it certainly has not attacked any countries. Uh, Yet Iran is supposed to be the one that we're scared of having, you know, that we're scared if Iran has a nuclear weapon. It's, it's, you know, when you actually think about it, it doesn't make any sense. And at the end of the day, it's, of course, a completely unequal system of the global north gets to have nukes. The global south doesn't. And that's the end of the that's the end of the discussion. Um, and it's all, like you said, imperial domination. Uh, yeah, and, and the problem is that the, the English press never approaches it this way. So there's course. never this fundamental, even in the op-eds you never find or rarely find any mention of, of, of these issues. So It's just this like paternalistic view too of the U.S. where uh, the U.S. has nuclear weapons to protect everyone or something, whereas, you know, Iran wants them for negative reasons or North Korea wants them for, you know, sadistic reasons or when in fact most countries who want nuclear weapons want them as a form of deterrence. And that's the reason the West and the global North don't want these countries to have them because it would be deterrence. It would deter other countries from aggressive maneuvers against them. Um, and you can't dominate a country if it has nuclear weapons or at least it's more difficult to dominate. So you have, um, you know, you were in Iran during the recent Israeli war on Gaza. Um, in your experience, how do Iranians feel about Israel, about Palestine, about resistance? I know you can't, not every Iranian feels the same way, but generally speaking, 
uh, and do their positions on this conflict and Iran's role in the region differ based on things like class and education um, and geographic region? That's right. Um, a very good question. And um, I would say that there is uh, diverse support for the Palestinian cause. And it's actually one of the early uh, values of the revolution. So uh, the revolution had two major values. One was class equality and the other was the support for the Palestinian cause. And the value of class equality was uh, a lot more difficult to accomplish. And it's become uh, probably faded over the years. But the support for the Palestinian cause is something that I would say has remained consistent as a revolutionary value. So it's the official ideology of the state. And if you go around Tehran uh, or any city in Iran, uh, oftentimes you find murals uh, that ha have a representation of the Palestinian cause and a stand in solidarity with Palestine. There's actually a really nice square called the Palestine Square in Tehran that has uh, murals of, of, uh, for Palestinians and in support of the Palestinian cause. Um, so you have this state ideology that's behind Palestine, but it's not just the state, also civil society. So a lot of artists, writers, intellectuals, they also support Palestine, uh, even if they don't identify with the state ideology and might support it on, on different grounds or with a, within a different social network. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, there, there was this uh, leftist economist uh, named Fari Borzereis Dana, who unfortunately pa uh, passed of uh, COVID-19 uh, about a year ago. And in one of his last interviews, he, he said that I'm not religious, so I don't support uh, Palestine based on any Muslim solidarity, but I support it as a human issue. Um, and so you have that example. So, so the state and civil society both support Palestine. Um, but then you have a second position, I would say second position, and that's a position of indifference. Mm. Um, so, and this is interesting because uh, it, when you talk to the Western left or to American leftists, uh, there, there's, there's still interventionists in some sense, right? So if, say something is happening in Venezuela, uh, they will back the anti-imperialist forces or the Bolivarian revolution in Venezuela and they're very engaged with it, right? They have to have an opinion, they have to engage with it, talk about it. And then the liberals and the right fingers then oppose uh, the anti-imperialists and support the, the liberal candidates or the candidates that are allied with the US, right? So there's this interventionist impulse across the spectrum in, in the US political discourse. Uh, but then in Iran, actually, um, a lot of people just don't really have an interest in giving opinions or in even uh, engaging with uh, other countries' affairs. So, you know, if you ask an Iranian, well, what do you think about Venezuela or Palestine? They will say, I hope the people of that country figure things out. And, you know, it's not, it's not my issue. Right. So you also have that position. And uh, it's not, it's not, uh, it's not an anti moral position. It's not an unethical position. It's just a position that I don't want to intervene. It's a different country. It has its own sovereignty and, and let them uh, decide things. Even though in the case of Palestine, I mean, there's not uh, official sovereignty, but, but you get my point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so th 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 those are the two positions, and there's a, there's a nasty position, a third position that's a reactionary position, and that is so whatever the state says. So if I oppose the state, I will also oppose Palestine. Ah. Mm -hmm. So you have a lot of, um, I guess, uh, just like reactionary is the best term for them, that just because the Islamic Republic supports Palestine, they will side with Israel, and they will just uh, repeat uh, a Zionist talking point. So a lot of times I've heard people uh, um I repeat the land purchase theory that well the Zionists and Israel just purchased uh, all the land and so they're entitled to it and there was no expulsion there was no Nakba none of that uh, but even I think even Zionist sources uh, dispute that and uh, I think it was something so from the late 19th century when the the Zionists settled in Palestine um, for for the next 60 years I think uh, uh, the Zionists only purchased about seven percent of the land. Um, so, and then after that, there was a conquest and they, they, they took over. Uh, but then there's this talking point among these reactionaries that no, you know, the, the, the uh, Israel bought all the land, so they're entitled to it. Uh, so there's that. And also part of that reactionary position is that, well, I don't want my money spent on the Palestinians. So if they need something, if they need aid or weapons, uh, I just, uh, you know, I don't care. All the money should be spent inside of Iran. And I mean, the, this position uh, that I don't want the, my, our money to be spent on them, I guess could be somewhere between the indifference position and the reactionary position. But I think it's more the reactionary position 
mm-hmm. that you know just spend all the money on 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 me the iranian not the palestinian um yeah and is there is there sorry is there a class or educational uh, division in in the sorts of people who might support one position over the other um or is it kind of those splits exist across class and educational lines yeah it's a good question i mean any anything i would say on this would be anecdotal so i better mm. not speculate so um yeah that's a I great mean, thing you just said by the way no one in america ever feels the need to say that <laughs> I wish Western pundits would know when they are like limit, like when they should say, okay, you know, I'm not quite sure. <laughs> I can't generalize, but I'm sorry. I finished your thought. No, no, no. You're right. I mean, no, I'm being honest. I mean, uh, honestly, I, I haven't studied uh, demographics on the Palestinian issue in Iran. Um, so I don't really know how it's divided across demographics. Uh, but I mean, well, you well, find- let me let me actually include this element to it, because um, this maybe this has that sort of division you could speak to. But similar to the Palestine issue, how do Iranians feel about their government's regional interventions in places like Syria, Iraq, Yemen? Um, how is this justified and does it receive support from the general population or older, are there also divisions and are those divisions similar to what you just described with the Palestinian issue? No, there, there, there are divisions um, and the divisions, a, a big one is again, this position of indifference. So a lot of them say that, well, this is an uh, issue for Yemenis, issue for so even if the, uh, the Syrian government uh, invites Iranian forces uh, or say, you know, the Houthis want Iran to engage, uh, a lot of Iranians would still say that, no, this is not for us to intervene in. So I would say the non-interventionist uh, mindset is a lot stronger in Iran compared to the US but because Americans are just ready to intervene in anything. Right. But, uh, you know, start an NGO. I mean, and the thing is what I find funny is that whatever is happening in the world, so somebody could have just found out about Maduro or about some elections in Bolivia um, and the immediate impulse they have is that I have to have an opinion. You know, I have to, you know, call on the UN and call on everyone. So even, even if the uh, um, American Organization of States is not a reliable source for monitoring elections, if you know they say anything, all these Americans will have an opinion, and they want to, you know, call on the NGOs and the UN and the IGOs and everyone to get involved to do something about the elections, <laughs> uh, even if there's no credible claim of cheating. Um, same with the, uh, yeah, so I mean, uh, that's, that, that, it's very non-interventionist, the mindset. So a lot of, Iran, and again, I don't know majority minority here, I don't have uh, clear data, uh, but a lot of Iranians uh, are non-interventionist and they say, you know, we don't want to get involved in these issues. Uh, but then there's a, the, the, there's a second position um, similar to the support for Palestine on Yemen, Syria, and Iraq, and that is either based on Shia solidarity or human solidarity. So a lot of them say that these are Shia brothers and sisters, and it's also in Afghanistan. So when the Hazara community uh, was targeted recently and uh, several uh, um, uh, girls, uh, school girls were, were killed, uh, there was a lot of a sense of Shia solidarity and there were events outside the Afghan embassy in Tehran. Um, and it's similar with Yemen and Iraq and Syria. So if they're Shia brothers and sisters or Shia holy sites, the idea is that we have to support them, right? So that's very different than a non-interventionist position. And then there's a, there's a human one. So the same people who support the Shia brothers and sisters would also support them because you know, it's a matter, a matter of uh, oppression, right? It's a, it's a human issue, right? And then there, there are people who don't have a strong Shia identity and they just uh, uh, support it based on human gr- grounds that, well, there's this brutal uh, international war that's being uh, a wage against Syrian sovereignty um, and they, they might they might have an opinion and and want to get involved. Uh, and there's a third there's a third position I should mention too. Um, so the indifference, the the Shia and human solidarity, and the third is a security position. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, similar to to any country that might have a foreign policy. The idea is that well, if something is happening in Iraq, so if Daesh is taking over Iraq, it might have consequences for Iran because we share a border. So based on a security uh, perspective, we have to get involved. So there's also that position. And I guess that that might be shared more by the by the politicians. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask you, too. Is there that element of, OK, well, the existence of ISIS in places like Syria and Iraq could have a huge destabilizing and actually uh, existential uh do existential damage to Iran if it is allowed to thrive and, and continue to grow. Um, that said, I, I'm curious how Iranians feel about 
improving ties with China? Um, do they, is there any kind of conversation happening in Iran, whether politically or generally in the media or among the population, um, about the idea of whether China can in any way free them from relying on making deals with the West? That's right. Yeah, and that's a, that's a very timely question uh, because on March twenty uh, seventh of two thousand twenty one, uh, this past March, uh, the Chinese foreign minister came to Iran, and Iran and China signed a twenty five year cooperation agreement that the uh, Western media, including the the Persian uh, media based in the West, was misrepresenting as some sort of a colonization project, uh, even though there's no evidence for that yet. Uh, but and, and there's actually an interesting uh, background to it because after a nuclear deal was signed in in uh, 2016, President Xi uh, came to Iran, uh, and the Rouhani administration was not interested in having uh, extensive cooperation with China at the time because the idea was that well we don't want to alienate the West and the Europeans, and we want to have these engagements with Europe uh, after the nuclear deal. So they kind of gave a cold shoulder to China, uh, from what I've understood. Uh, but then most recently, especially after Trump withdrew from the agreement, the idea is that uh, China would be a good ally for economic uh, and perhaps other forms of uh, cooperation. Uh, so that 25-year cooperation agreement was signed. As far as I know, the text hasn't been released, so the details aren't fully clear. Um, but then what what is uh, kind of ironic is that when the nuclear deal, and this is, this is against, again, anecdotal from what I hear on the streets, but then what, what happened is after the nuclear deal, nobody was saying that, oh, they sold out our nation. So the idea was that, okay, we'll get sanctions relief and, you know, uh, this might be a good thing. Um, so nobody, nobody had this idea that uh, the nation has been sold out, right? But then when the, the China deal was reached, I remember for about a month, if you would go to the shops and if you would go uh, in the taxis or your families, whatever, who, who are you talking to? They had this idea that they have sold the nation to China. And I think it goes back to our representation by Western media that this is a colonization project by China, even though there's no evidence for it yet. Uh, so there was that. And what's ironic is that actually the nuclear deal compromised Iranian sovereignty. Again, we're talking about should Iran concede. So the nuclear deal actually uh, minimized Iranian defense capabilities, right? But the, the, this deal with China has no has no demands like that. It seems the political and military demands are not similar. So China is not asking Iran uh, to stop making weapons and so on, right? So the irony is there. Um, and yeah, and so there was that kind of popular perception of, of the ag uh, agreement with China. Um, but then the other thing is in terms of, well, whether the second part of your question, whether making deals with China uh, will help Iran against the relying on the West. Uh, I mean, Iranian policy is, and this is a slogan of the revolution, that neither East nor West, uh, the Islamic Republic. So the idea is that they don't want to rely on Eastern powers nor on Western powers. Rather, they want to have an indigenous uh, economy and they want to have their independence and sovereignty. So. Uh, the Iranian mindset is that China cannot free us from anything, right? So, I mean, the thing is you can you can have deals with different countries and with different power zones, but the idea is that at the end of the day, you have to be self-sufficient and rely on yourself. So I think that's the shared kind of sentiment from the elite level to the popular, le popular level that you, I mean, you can make a deal with China, especially to offset the so-called maximum pressure campaign by the U.S., but you should not rely on them as any sort of liberation, because at the end of the day, the the mindset is that only self sufficiency self sufficiency can can help Iran. So then, my next question, after all of those things you just talked about, and you kind of mentioned this in passing, is you know Iran is inundated with all this foreign backed opposition media. Some of it's supported by the Saudis, by the Americans, by the Israelis, by pro Shah Iranians in the West. So I'm curious, are these attempts influential or successful in shaping Iranian perceptions? What's their impact? That's right. So uh, there are numerous foreign medias that Iranians consume. So some examples are the U.S.-funded Voice of America, the British-backed uh, BBC Persian. Uh, then you have uh, what is um, probably a Saudi-funded Iran International uh, the Guardian broke the story on that, even though Iran International denies it, but it appears that they have Saudi funding and also they're based in the UK. 
Um, and then uh, you have so many media, so VOA, BBC Persian, Iran International, these are some of the big ones. And then you also have all these uh, satellite channels coming out of LA where the Iranian diaspora, the regime change Iranian diaspora is, and they also bombard Iranians on a daily with uh, regime change propaganda. And Iranians consume this. So uh, a lot of Iranians, especially uh, middle uh, and upper middle classes have satellites in their homes uh, and they consume this news. And, and actually the difference with, with the US is really staggering because if you are an American and you, know, you turn on the TV or even open your internet browser, um, you will not have much access to the, the foreign medias, right? So I mean, uh, the big tech uh, kind of censoring a lot of alternative news and foreign medias for American access, especially after 2016. And on TV, you cannot access it. So I remember, I mean, Russia Today, I think used to be on some, you could access it on, on US uh, TV, but then I think they got rid of it after 2016. And also Iran's press TV that, that has actually better, I would say it has better programming on domestic US politics in some cases than American media does, they were completely taken off satellite networks. So if you have a dish in the US, you cannot even access press TV. And then if you go on YouTube or Facebook and Twitter, a lot of times their pages keep getting taken down mm -hmm. and they have to create a new page and so on. So, um, uh, and I mean, e even if the Americans had access, so even if there were not obstacles, most Americans uh, kind of have this uh, trust uh, in their own media and the idea is that well, I only watch you know my NPR and my Fox News and CNN and whatever uh, but Iranians are actually the opposite so the idea is that well not not everyone but a lot of Iranians the idea is that I can you know I, I just want to watch these satellite uh, uh, channels right um, and I mean if it was good programming I would be okay with it but the problem is that a lot of it is just regime change propaganda and Iranians consume it and what ends up happening is that these uh, Western positions get reproduced. So just like with the, with the uh, China agreement, the 25 year agreement, the immediate idea on the streets was that, oh, well, this is, uh, you know, that they have sold out the country, right? Because they were consuming those medias. And again, I'm, I'm, I don't have some naivety that uh, the, chi the China agreement is all good and everything is good about it. I mean, there, there is a potential that uh, penetration of global capital through the agreement would disturb local economies, mm -hmm. right? But I'm saying, uh, since we don't have much uh, concrete evidence right now, we shouldn't speculate too much. And definitely the colonization argument uh, does not hold in this case. No, totally. Um, you know, I want to, I, we kind of already, we talked about sanctions already, but I, I wanted to ask you, you know, when we think about sanctions on Venezuela or sanctions on Syria, they're just completely suffocating and have devastated the countries to such a degree. But Iranian see, Iran seems to have thrived a little bit under these crushing, brutal sanctions, right? Well, these other countries like even Iraq in the 90s, um, you know, completely devastated or, you know, in Syria and Venezuela, the kind of suffering we're seeing today is, is actually similar to Iraq in the 90s. So why is that? Why is it that Iran has been able to be more resilient against this sanction, this brutal crippling attempt to starve the country? That's right. So I think a big part of that goes back to the national production and the resistance economy that, that we were talking about. So Iran has very strong national production industries. And in fact, it, it uh, exports a lot of products to the uh, Iraqi economy and the economy in Afghanistan. Um, so there's a very strong uh, national uh, production industry uh, and uh, I was mentioning so from hygienic products uh, to refrigerators um, to even cars, uh, a lot of these are produced in Iran and a lot of them are of competitive quality. I mean things like laptops Iran doesn't produce but it, it's even producing cars right now and in a lot of cases they might not be as good as a Toyota but is still, you can get a, a decent Iranian car, Iranian main car. Um, so there are all these, and, and what actually makes it interesting too, this strong national production industry is that it, uh, it safeguards Iran from the lowering of quality that comes with globalization. So if you go to a vegetable market or a fruit market in Iran, it's way better than even the farmer's market in the, in the US, right? So when you, get a, when you get a fruit, it doesn't look very good. Uh, so you look at it and like, you know, this looks kind of beat up and it's not that pretty, but once you eat it, the taste is just heavenly, right? Mm 
and it's, it was even better before because I think I mean the, 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 the globalization, even though we had we had the revolution, globalization does leave some impact. Uh, so from my from uh, uh, my parents, I hear that the fruit was even better uh, in their days. Uh, but yeah, because Iran has this uh, national production, including in food and agriculture, the 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 fruits uh, taste amazing. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's also true about fruits and vegetables. Like they, we, when they look super pristine, they actually don't taste as good. <laughs> There's something to be said about that. Um, no, and you know, know what's funny, uh, what's funny about that is uh, th there was this, also this uh, trend in Iran where they, they serve, they sell what is called uh, Mive Majlisi and Mive Majlisi means basically like uh, party fruits, right? Mm. And the party fruit is the the stuff they they import that looks really big and really pretty. It's a lot more expensive, and people buy it for parties because it looks so luxurious. But then the Iranian fruit doesn't look as good, right? But it's a lot cheaper. Uh, and then if you want to eat good fruit, that's what you get. Yeah. But if you want to have a party, you get the you get the you get the fruit. bad tasting but pretty fruit. <laughs> that's, that's that's funny. Um. I want to go back to Iranian sentiments uh, real quick. Uh, I wanted to ask you about the does, about uh, Qasem Soleimani. Does the killing of Qasem Soleimani still resonate with people in Iran? And what did he mean to Iranians? That's right. So I think uh, to understand Qasem Soleimani, we have to understand the, the context uh, in which he was uh, raised. Uh, so again, uh, giving uh, some history here. Uh, what happens after the revolution is that there's this concern that they would be a coup d'etat again against the revolution as the, there was in 1953 against Mossadegh's nationalization of oil. Uh, so Khomeini actually institutes the Revolutionary Guard uh, and a lot of the members come from the, the communities and from the, the revolutionaries. And the, the Revolutionary Guard or the SEPA develops parallel to the army. Right, so in this way, they're trying to minimize the, the possibilities that there would be a coup d'etat against the revolution. And the reason is that a lot of Global South uh, armies were colonially manufactured, right? So you could have had uh, a new prime minister or a revolutionary president, but then if the army was colonially manufactured and dependent on the West, that wouldn't really matter because these were the guys with guns. So the reform, the, uh, the revolutionary uh, president could be easily taken out in a coup d'etat, right? So Khomeini's idea was that, and I think he might have been following some of the socialist revolutions in this case, it is that, you, that. Yeah. Yeah, you build a parallel institution uh, that is armed, but it's not the army. And so revolutionary guard comes about. And even though it has grown quite pow powerful over the years, uh, it still does have uh, uh, some popular base. Right, so we can't really see Qasem Soleimani as you know an abstract general, like an American general that people might have heard of at some point. And if that person dies, you know there is a memorial or something, and then it's kind of over. But then uh, Qasem Soleimani, especially because uh, he comes from a working class background himself, he comes from a, a poor community, and he was also active during the Iran and Iraq War. He's seen as a national hero. Mm. Right. So there's this reverence and respect for him. And then he's not. And again, not, we shouldn't compare him to that abstract general. Right. So for a lot of people, he was more like a community elder or a teacher. And that's how that's how they looked at him. And uh, I would say it's not just Iranians who remember him and will remember him for many years to come. Uh, it's also ge generally the anti-imperialist uh, peoples around the world. Um, and I think this is uh, one big reason that the big tech was so. Uh, was censoring so hard when he was assassinated because I remember I had a a very uh, very descriptive neutral post about him on my Facebook and I just kind of described his working class background and his wishes to be uh, buried uh, in in his hometown and kind of said you know who he was and so there was nothing celebratory about him in the post but I remember it got taken without any more report because it was a private post just sharing with my friends. And uh, without anyone reporting it, even though maybe there were snitches in my in my, in my uh, profile and the reporters, who knows? But without mm -hmm. anyone reporting it, the uh, the post was taken down. The post was taken down, and Instagram and Facebook were engaged in that campaign of taking down anything about Qasem Soleimani, including pictures and including the neutral posts. So I think the negative ones uh, stayed up because I saw some negative posts um, that stayed up. Uh, but the the neutral, the positive ones were all taken down. So I think that also shows how popular he was around the world more generally.
Yeah, I had something taken down actually the, a few months ago. So it's not even like this just happened immediately after he died. Tech companies continue to try to control the narrative about him even more than a year after he was murdered by the U.S. Um, I want to turn to a slightly different issue, but I think it's interesting. I'm curious about, you know, we some every once in a while we hear that there's this Jewish community in Iran. And you know, when I think about Jews across the Middle East, like they, you know, some of the oldest Jewish communities in the world were living in the Middle East before the creation of Israel, whether it was, uh, you know, Arab Jews in Baghdad, Syria, um, there was even some in Lebanon. Uh, and because of Zionism and the creation of Israel and um, this attempt to get, you know, Jews around the world to come to Israel and just the way that imposing this Jewish sectarian state on the Middle East fractured uh, these various societies, you don't have Jews in Syria anymore or in Iraq anymore or um, in Morocco anymore. But in Iran, you still continue to have this Jewish community that doesn't seem interested in moving to Israel ever, which is a good thing. I'm just curious, like you're, you know, from your perspective, or, or, you know, wh why is that? Why is it that, you know, the Jewish community in Iran has been more resilient against Zionism and its attempt to try to, you know, we're basically remove Jews from the region and put them all in Israel. That's right. Um, so I would say, uh, I mean, there, there is just to modify that the, the premise of the question a bit. There, there were some uh, Jewish immigration outside Iran uh, after the revolution, uh, but as you correctly say, uh, there's also a big Jewish community, at least uh, comparatively, that stays in Iran. Uh, and they have their uh, their own um, uh, member of parliament, and they have political representation, and they also have places of uh, worship that they can attend. Um, and I think a lot of them uh, identify more with Iranian nationalism than they identify with Zionism. So if you look at uh, look at Zionism as a form of nationalism, between those competing nationalisms, uh, they identify more with the Iranian nationalism. And in fact, a lot of them. Uh, uh, fought in the Iran and Iraq war, and there is a mural uh, of the Jewish martyrs uh, on the intersection of Vadi As and Mir Damat Street. So there's actually a, a big computer store. It's, uh, I think, a, a several, a, a multiple uh, uh, story building uh, on the intersection of, so if anybody uh, from your audience travels to Iran, <laughs> intersection of Mir Damad and uh, Vadi As, um, it's right across the bus station uh, in Tehran. You see this big mural of uh, Iranian Jews who were martyred uh, in the Iran and Iraq war. Um, yeah, so I think at the end of the day, it has uh, to do with them identifying more with Iranian nationalism than they identify with Zionism. Hey, that, that's, a really, that's really interesting. Um, and then I want to go a little bit more to, to you personally. Can you give us, can you tell people a little bit about your field of study, which I think is really interesting and obviously unique, uh, which you're working, you're getting, a, you're working on your PhD. Um, mm -hmm. And what, like, so what's your personal academic interests? What are they and why? All right, so the, the esoteric responses I have to give. Yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, so, I mean, uh, if I want to say it very broadly, I work on the intersection of uh, political and intellectual histories of uh, Iran and the Persianate world. And so the Persianate world are the Persian-speaking uh, cultures outside Iran, because a lot of times when we think about the Persian language, we think of Iran, uh, but Persian was actually uh, written and produced in courts, uh, royal courts around the world. Uh, so you had uh, Persian courts in India, you had them in Central Asia, uh, and you also had Persian-speaking intellectuals in the Caucasus, uh, for example. So the Persian world uh, is not just Iran, but can include the Caucasus, Central Asia, uh, and South Asia. Uh, so I, I, I work on the histories, the intellectual and political histories of Iran and the Persian world. Uh, and most specifically, uh, I'm writing my dissertation on the transformation from pre-national or pre-modern education to national education. So how was it that pre-modern education changed and became the national education that we're all used to, you know, the schools that we go, we went to every day. Uh, a lot of them had a very, uh, very big discipline. So you had to cut your nails, your hair had to be uh, proper, at least in Iran, that's how it was. Um, so I'm looking at how that transition was made because pre-modern uh, classical education was very different 
than, than modern education. So that's my immediate uh, dissertation topic. And uh, I guess you also asked why, should I respond to that? Yeah, yeah, why? Like what, what brought you to you know be so interested in this issue that you would spend years researching it, I guess, yeah. Sure, well, I mean, uh, maybe not this specific issue, but just generally studying uh, Iranian history and Persian histories. Um, and also sometimes giving uh, commentaries on current affairs that connect to Iran. A, a big reason is that uh, because of my bicultural and bilingual abilities. And the problem is that if you uh, follow especially the, the media, there are a lot of people uh, who claim to know some Persian, but the Persian is not very good or they've never traveled to Iran. Uh, and I mean, uh, you don't really have to travel to say the right things but then you do have to know the language because if you don't mm. know the language then you cannot access the culture and the history so a lot of your interpretations will not be very good so i saw that there's this kind of uh need for bicultural and actually bilingual um writers and a specialist on on iran and on iranian history and i thought that well you know i have i have these abilities might as well put them to use <laughs> And then I'm just curious politically, like you, you have a pretty interesting background. You, um, you, we, we had been talking before you moved to the U S when you were a teenager at a, at a pretty interesting time from Iran, right? It was just before nine 11, which was a pretty difficult time to, I think, be from anywhere, whether it's Iran or anywhere in the middle East, um, just in terms of being that ethnicity, but you actually like were, grew up in, in Iran. Um, and so you came up in the U.S., you know, in high school. I'm curious, like, what was that experience like um, being, you know, going from somewhere like Iran to coming to this place in America where just being from there causes this sort of, um, you know, instinctive reaction that's kind of negative most of the time for most people? That's right. And I mean, uh, I think we talked about this, too, that, you know, if I tell a Yemeni or an Iraqi who's not happy with Iranian intervention in their country, um, that I'm from Iran, the reception is usually very positive. It's the same in Lebanon. So in Lebanon, I mean, there are certain uh, Shia neighborhoods like Dahia that might be more uh, Iran friendly, but then there are other neighborhoods that are not. But even in those neighborhoods, if, if I say I'm from Iran, usually the reception is very positive because I would say in, in uh, West Asia, uh, or Middle East, uh, people distinguish between the governments and the people. So the idea is that, especially because in, in uh, most Middle Eastern histories, the nation and the state had parallel developments, right? Because a lot of the states were just colonial uh, transplants, right? So they, were, they had uh, kind of uh, colonial connections and the, and the nation never felt that close to them, right? So you have this national history, you have the state history that are developing parallel. But then in the West, I think the nation estate, because it's indigenous to the West, the, the nation estate, it grew more organically and more you know, entangled. Uh, but yeah, people in, in the Middle East uh, distinguish between the people and the government. So if I tell them I'm from Iran, uh, and even if they don't like something about the Iranian state, they're still super friendly. But in the US, it was the opposite because you know I come and I'm excited to share my culture and my knowledge of my history and whatever. Um, and I'm talking to them and uh, I say something about Iran or they ask me where I'm from because they hear the accent and well, you know, the accent according to them because everybody has an accent. Uh, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah, so I tell them I'm from Iran uh, and usually the, the, the reactions were very negative. So they were, it was almost like, you know, like as, as if I've insulted their mother, you know, as if, you know, I have just insulted, it's like, so I never understood that. Um, and I think it's part of it has to do with this media propaganda we talked about because the amount of misinformation Americans get about these fabricated enemies or real enemies, uh, but a lot of misinformation uh, and they identify with their state. That's why, you know, when they talk about the military, like if you, I mean, we talked about how Hassan Soleimani is very popular in Iran, uh, but then if the Iranians are talking about their, the Artesh, the military, or even about the Sepah, the Revolutionary Guard, they don't usually say we, they don't say like we went there. They just, you know, identify the, the institution. But in the US, if you're talking about the military, you always say when we went to Iraq or when we went to, you know, X and Y or, you know, our men, our military, right? So they, they uh, I, uh, strongly identify with the state. And I think that's one reason the, the uh, reactions were so negative. And I guess yeah. uh, part of the, uh, the purpose of your show, I think, is to 
kind of counter some of these uh, misinformation and negative views that Americans have. Oh, a hundred percent. And, um, you know, I also think it's interesting, like, did you, I'm curious from your own personal experience, did that change in college? Cause you also, you, you're, you went to Columbia in New York. Um, and, uh, I met like, was that different from your high school experience when people are a little bit older, maybe they're like adults and in certain departments, yes. um, if they're studying in certain departments, maybe they have a bit of a different attitude. Did, did that, do does that response that you might have gotten when you were younger has that changed or is it the same yeah i mean well i mean uh colombia is not a good example because i'm at a department called middle eastern south asian <laughs> right <laughs> and, and we have a lot of uh, we have a lot of uh anti-imperialist professors i think you had actually professor uh, joseph Massad on your show yeah. um so when you deal with people like him talk to people like him uh, the, they're not going to have those attitudes you know they, they know what's up so uh, Colombia is not the best example, but I would say the broader culture. So yeah. in New York, you can still get, you know, these like stupid questions. Like people ask you, if you tell them that you're traveling to Iran, they ask you, oh, is it dangerous? You know, what are they going to do to you? Are they going to kidnap you? It's actually really funny because I remember somebody uh, once came up to me. Uh, this is in New York. In New York. I think he was New Yorker, presumably. And he, he asked me after he found out I was from Iran, uh, he asked me that, why is it that Iran kidnaps Americans? And uh, it was actually funny because, I mean, it is true that Iran has imprisoned a number of Americans uh, or dual nationals, uh, but then it, it cannot kidnap them because it's not a private actor, right? It's a state actor and the state actors do not kidnap people, they imprison people. So I think the sense of misinformation, also entitlement is so, it's so large that, you know, if I'm in Iran and something happens to me, I'm kidnapped, I'm not imprisoned, right? So, uh, That's a good point. Yeah. America kidnap. If you want to use that language, I guess America kidnaps a lot of people who come from South America. If you want to talk about, you know, if you want to turn imprisonment to kidnapping, but yeah, it's a, okay. uh, it's an interesting concept or it's an interesting um, framework that Americans uh, view, view Iran in. And I think it was interesting. Also, you were telling me, cause you were just explaining how the reaction you get like from here in Lebanon, people, even if they may, might be anti-Iranian, Iranian like government, they're still like, oh, you're Iranian. That's really cool. Whereas what about like Arab Americans in the US? Is there a different reaction you'll get? Does the American part of them like kind of uh, cancel out the Middle Easter side of them if they grew up in the US? Yeah, no, that's a good question. <laughs> I would say generally not. Generally, if they're Arab Americans, especially because they've received so much yeah, xenophobia yeah. and racism, um, they, they, yeah, they're generally not like that. They generally don't ask offensive questions or uh, get kind of, you know, put on a guard. Ah, you're Iranian. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> it's, not, it's, not, it's not that explicit, but yeah. Uh, well, uh, Naveed, thank you so much for joining me and giving me so much of your time and our listeners and viewers. Um, I personally learned a lot, and I hope those who get to watch this also learned a lot. Um, is there anywhere where people can follow along with your writing mm -hmm. that you'd like to give a shout out to? Uh, you know, honestly, just my email. Uh, I mean, I have, uh, I have some social media, but I don't really, uh, it's not really public. It's just mostly a, like a close community because uh, I don't want trolls on there. But if, uh, <laughs> if you want to contact me, yeah, if you want to contact me for, um, uh, any any matter, my email is the best place to reach me. So it's my first name, Navid, N A V I D, period. My last name, Zarinal, Z A R R I N A L, at columbia.edu. Navid, thank you so much for joining thank me you. today.